we found that because you're towing that weight for two and a half thousand miles, it's just impossible to cover your mouth. And in the tent every night, when you go to sleep, all the scabs stick together very hard. And when you wake up in the morning and you want porridge out of your bowl, first of all, you've got to open your lips, okay? And you can't pull them apart, they're really entwined. So you use a Swiss Army knife, not the knife, but the, the file. And you slowly file your lips apart. Lots of blood. I was born in Windsor, outside the castle, obviously, <laughs> uh, at a time when it was being bombed during the Second World War. I was um, born four months after my dad was killed. He was commanding the Royal Scots Greys uh, Cavalry Regiment, 60-ton tanks. His mum, my granny, was uh, South African from Cape Town, and being bossy, she took me, age one, and my big sisters, three of them, and my mum, out to South Africa with her. And for 10 years, we lived out there. I went to four schools in South Africa. And um, then she died, and mum wanted to come back to the UK with her children. She was looking for somewhere to educate us, and was very happy when she found a place called Winchester College, which took anybody totally free of charge, providing your family name was fines. You could only get in free if you not only got um, name of fines, but also you passed an entrance exam. And that was too much for me and I couldn't pass it. So I couldn't get to be Colonel, which is what I wanted, like my dad, because I couldn't get to Sandhurst College. There was a secondary alternative in Aldershot called Mons, so I went for that and I did manage just to pass that one. And I eventually ended up in a thing called the Special Air Service, SAS. Uh, nobody in those days had ever heard of the SAS. And I applied to join the Arab army in Arabia, fighting the Marxists um, who had taken over parts of the Islamic heritage of the Yemen. And so I spent two years, um, my last two in the army, fighting for the Arab uh, Omanis to try and stop the Soviet taking over. Basically, I managed to kill the two main people on an ambush, and that just held it long enough for the Sultan of Oman to get rid of the remaining Marxists. So that was at least something that came out of my army, even if I didn't get to be like Dad. I won't go into details, but I used army explosives to blow up a civilian property uh, in the UK. And I ended up in six months police probation. I was thrown out of the special air service when I was thrown out of the army and I got married to my sort of childhood sweetheart, uh, Ginny. She's um, now you know, my late wife of 36 years. I didn't marry her till she was 21 and I was 24. And at that particular time, neither of us had any money. So we sat down and we worked out a way of surviving, which depended on getting whatever you want that you can't afford because you don't have the money in other ways. And she decided what we would do was to do the first ever journey up the longest river in the world, the Nile. And that one succeeded, did the first one, then in British Columbia in Canada, did in rapids and so on. And so we made a name for ourselves without money. And we got, in seven years of hard work, Ginny and I got 1,900 sponsor companies. So everything we needed to do the first ever journey around Earth, the planet Earth, without flying one meter of the entire journey and going circumpolar, okay, not horizontally around, Never been done before, never been done since. Captain Scott in Antarctica had got to do his attempt to cross Antarctica. He was, had support from the Royal Navy. Ginny and I didn't have support from any sort of governmental background. And the only thing was that I had been in the Special Air Service. So I went to the headquarters of the SAS and 
told them Ginny's idea of this incredible expedition to do the first journey around Earth. And they said, we, the SS, like your idea, but we don't like you. They were remembering I'd been sacked and all that. So what they decided was that they would put in charge of this amazing journey, uh, they would put the officer who had six years earlier thrown me out of the SAS in nominal charge of the expedition, which was typical SAS sort of thought. How long did the Transglobe expedition take? It took us unbelievably seven years to get those 1900 sponsors in place, including a 1.8 million ice strengthened ship that was sponsored by an insurance company in London, Bowering, uh, including a ski plane. We would never fly, but we needed a plane that could land on ice because if, as was likely, we came to grief at some point in Antarctica or the Arctic, in, in every field, Ginny became key to it. She was in charge of all the planning and the communications, for which during those seven years of preparation, she joined the London Territorial Royal Signals. At the end of the five years, she was better at mark frequency prediction, which is vital, than Marconi, better than the British Antarctic Survey at antenna theory. So having her making sure that the travel team, me and two others, Charlie Burton uh, was one of them, the two of us managed to do the first journey around Earth as a result of 10 years hard work. The hardest point, I think, was the Arctic. We had assumed the Antarctic with its crevasses would be, um, but it wasn't, it was the Arctic. Because of course up there, it's moving. You've got, you're crossing the sea with ice, and in those days, only six weeks a year would that break up in the midsummer, and then the ice flows were moving about. You could travel then because of the heat, heat going from minus 60 to only about minus 10. So that was possible, but there were other obstacles in getting from one ice flow to another. If you're going like that to the North Pole you know, and over the top back down the other side, you're going over on this and you're wanting the ice flows, which are traveling and you're traveling on the ice flows, to go north because that's where you want. But the ice flows are disobedient. They go where they want. And a multi-year ice, ice flow of eight foot ice will move at a different, maybe go west one day, whereas the next door one, which is only a two year flow, not so deep, will go in a different direction. And we didn't realize this until we did it. And at any one moment, what, when you think you're safe, it can go off in, in one direction and remove, and you then get nylas, which is highly dangerous black ice. You've got to keep going, so you become an expert at knowing whether it might keep your weight or not, and whether or not at that moment to waste time tying a rope between the two of you. So it becomes an expertise. And I would say that Mike Stroud, Charlie Burton and me became the world's experts at traveling over moving ice. Doesn't really help get a job in the UK, but <laughs> no A-level. We were on a route which uh, Canadian polar bears frequented. And uh, four years earlier in the preparation stage, we got onto the Canadian government. And they said, it was very nice of them, that if you're going on the route that we said we were to the pole, that would be Canadian polar bears. And only 10% of Canadian polar bears eat humans. Only one was definitely going to attack us. And um, I, I knew that what you do is you, which we certainly didn't want to do, is to shoot it. And it went, was going around our tent like that. We were about 20 yards outside the tent. And each time it went round, it got nearer to us. So I said to Charlie, if it comes around the next time, if it gets past that lump of ice, we'll have to shoot it. I had a 38 Smith & Wesson pistol. He had a 303 uh, rifle. And when it came past it, definitely was going to attack. Or when a polar bear is attacking you, always aim below its chin here. Yeah. And I did that. And in the army, I was a very good shot. But I think I might have been nervous because um, aiming there, I hit it in the foot. And it sort of stopped and thought something had happened to it. And then it sort of turned around and started loping away. So we didn't shoot it. And it just swam from our ice flow to another one and had a, a, a leak, a slight blood from the foot. So um, forever after, I was taunted by the SAS people. Couldn't even kill a polar bear. 
When we reached the North Pole, we had become the first humans ever to reach both poles in the same expedition. And you were always prepared to die? No, I was prepared not to die, not prepared to die, but um, prepared to not get stupid thoughts about don't do it because of this, that and the other. Um, you've got, you've got a, a wimpish, weak voice will come into your head as you're moving. And you, you've got crutch rot, you've got amputation dangers, and into your head comes this weak, uninvited voice saying, I've got to stop, I've got to stop. And uh, you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, let's hope that someone else on the team has to stop, then it won't be you at fault. How are you communicating with the ship and with Ginny? Up there, Morse code only. In Antarctica, basically, you use a theodolite uh, when, you, when you can, and that will give you direction. But that's because you're traveling over a solid thing, Antarctica. It's 10,000 foot of mountain and 1,000 foot of icing cake on top, which is moving off. But in the Arctic, it's very, very much difficult. The, the magnetic stuff just doesn't work up there at all. And for a whole month up there, Ginny was trying to get where were Charlie and I moving over the ice flows that I told you about earlier. And I was the navigator, but I was unable to say where we were. And the committee in London, Prince Charles is the patron and so on, they then from London sent a message to Ginny that she must get the ski plane um, to collect Charlie Burden and me, the travel group, as soon as possible, otherwise we'd be dead. So she sent a message, uh, she got a message from the London commanding base, remove them, abort the expedition. Abort the expedition after 10 years, seven years preparation, three years actually doing it, 10 years of our lives, both of us, and all the people who joined us unpaid, okay? It was very, very difficult to accept. And what Jenny said on the radio, and Anton Bowring of the ship's crew heard her say it, uh, we couldn't quite get your message, London, but we think you said carry on. They'd actually said abort. And so we did carry on, and eventually, they very cleverly, Anton, the guy I told you about, Bowring, in charge of the ship, and Ginny very cleverly reckoned that if we were going the way they thought, it would take us out at a certain point by Greenland. And suddenly, after reaching the North Pole, okay, we only had the last bit to do, which was difficult, and in that bit, it looked as though we were going to die because everything was going wrong in the ice. And so they got to within uh, 22 miles from where they said we were. And at that point, they said again, Morse code to Jenny, um, what you must do is to go here and we think they'll come out. Got the message and uh, Charlie and I headed for where they said. And Charlie and I had been out up there looking at nothing but ice and water for eight months. Temperatures down minus 60 at one point. And one day in a very knackered state, which had a bad effect on our abilities, uh, we saw something that wasn't white after eight months. And it turned out to be in the far distance. You just see these two little black things on the horizon. And Charlie said, look, it's the mast of the ship. And we climbed a 40 foot bit of ice because when ice collides, it sends up so you can get a view. And those two little black things were just the top of the mast. That moment, the result of 10 years work of our lives, that was the most wonderful moment. And by sheer, I don't like saying good luck, sounds bad, doesn't mean we've done it. It's luck, lady luck. Anyway, whatever it was, we succeeded. We did the first ever journey around the whole earth Captain Scott did to the pole, other pole, never been done again by human beings on their own planet. What were you eating on these expeditions? That, that is why these records had not been broken, even by the Norwegians, our main rivals historically, because you've got to take enough food. And on our most 
difficult journey of all, which was in, I think, the 1993, was to beat the Norwegians by doing the last great polar expedition to cross the whole of Antarctica um, with no aid or support of any type. And that means that on day one, you are hauling 485 pound load, 190 pounds was the weight a horse might carry. 190, I'm talking about 485 pounds. Jenny recruited in 93, uh, Britain's director of the British Army, DA, he was director of APRE, Army Personnel Research Establishment. And his job was to get soldiers to go further. And to do that, you've got to have food for longer and it weighs more. So the key, and he is an expert at it, it's called stress nutrition. Actually, it's study of starvation, but the army called it a polite term. And his name was Professor Stroud, and he was the expert. And Ginny recruited him. So that expedition, he and I, did the first ever unsupported crossing of the entire continent, far bigger than America, with only what we carried to begin with. The Guinness Book of Records now has us as having done the longest unsupported polar journey in history. And uh, I remember that with great uh, pain, body pain. It hadn't done us any good. You can ruin yourself for later life by getting done when you really feel possible you can. When we did that first uh, Antarctic thing, we were carrying that weight, but not one item was unnecessary. So we knew it would take about three months to do the crossing, but we wouldn't take a toothbrush for three months why clean your teeth? It's not vital to your survival. If you want a, a porridge bowl uh, to have your breakfast, the two of you don't take two bowls, take one big bowl. As you know, the ozone hole causes skin cancer. And in Antarctica, that's particularly bad, and we knew that. So what would be happening would be that we would cover our skin. We found that because you're towing that weight, for two and a half thousand miles. It's just impossible to cover your mouth. You can't breathe in like that, so you can't cover your lips. So they get very uh, scabby, and in the tent every night when you go to sleep, all the scabs stick together very hard. And when you wake up in the morning and you want porridge out of your bowl, first of all, you've got to open your lips, okay? And you can't pull them apart, they're really entwined. So you use the Swiss Army knife, not the knife, but the, the file, and you slowly file your lips apart, lots of blood, and then you want your breakfast. So when you're eating breakfast out of one bowl, all your blood goes into his porridge, and this causes bad relations. And the frostbite on your hand? When I got back from that particular expedition, all those bits were frozen, and, the thing, and so, you can imagine a mummified pink or purple dead finger end. Well, if you touch the dead stuff against something, it is really agonizing. So when we got back to the UK with the fingers like that, um, I said I wanted to have them cut off immediately, amputated. And they said, no, they will not amputate until five months after the trauma because in between the dead bit and the live bit, there was a semi-traumatized bit. And that can, if you wait five months, that can be a bit longer. Well, after two months of going around touching things with like that, and at night when you change in the pillow, you turn over and that, you know, I was getting really, she was right, impatient. So I thought, um, we, we, we can cut them off. And Jenny said, yes. By then, she was actually not doing the communications. She had a farm of Aberdeen Angus cattle on Exmoor. And when the bull's uh, hooves got too big, she had clippers and she'd clip the end of the bull's thing. And if she got too close to the still live hoof, the bull would misbehave and kick and so on. So she would move the clippers into the dead bit more. So I got these uh, special clippers I got a Black & Decker workbench, and I could put the finger that way up, tighten it up like that so it couldn't move, and then with a special fret saw, 
I would cut that way, turn it round, cut there, turn it round. And create. The thumb took two days because of the bone in the middle being difficult. But the physical lady, physicist or whatever you call them, up in Bristol, she said I'd done a good job. Uh, and when, but when the surgeon, after five months, saw that I had done this, he was not very happy. Yeah, I thought it was going to stop me doing any more polar expeditions. Having the thing, but it actually, in the long run, they were all right. The relationships and team that you had around you, how did those relationships evolve? Well, you, you might say if, if you're married, you'd know the answer because it's like a marriage sort of thing. And you, normally you will have got rid of quite a few people who were thinking of staying with your group. So the ones you end up with sort of thing, you know their pros and cons, pluses and minuses. And I have to say that um, to try and get specialists, like a specialist navigator or a particular form of scientific knowledge uh, rather than going by their character. So is it, you're going for specialists or people whose character is easy and nice and so on. We've always found that you can uh, change the, um, what they actually do. You can sort of change it as you go along and therefore looking for that word, dreadful word, nice, looking for nice people is better than looking for a particular type of specialist. And you teach that nice person the scientific bits and pieces that you need to know, whereas the other way around, you can't. You can't change character, you can teach people. Foreign Office Polar Desk um, have awarded a huge new mountain in Antarctica in Ginny's name uh, just because of one of the most difficult expeditions they'd known about and uh, she really did live up to that and proved to the world that women are just as important in our field of exploration and breaking records as men. Is there anything that you still hope to achieve? There's various sort of things. Uh, when I got uh, Parkinson, I uh, diagnosed about seven years ago, um, I read the very interesting books of, of an American actor called Michael J. Fox. And he had found that swimming in cold water for quite a reasonable bit of time um, had the amazing effects. And he would then, after having done a successful swim, he would then be able to feel much, much better, not so much shaking and so on. And um, yeah, so he's successful. So I've intended to do that. But I found that <laughs> because I'd spent my life trying to keep warm, to try and get cold didn't make the sense at all. And I've so far only managed, um, I hate saying this, but I've only managed four and a half minutes. But basically, to answer your question, I'm hoping to get better at it. And next time I'll go for 10 minutes and hopefully still be um, able to stay out there. Yeah. How are you now? How, how am I now? The, the Parkinson's thing is uh, definitely not too bad with me, touch wood. Outside of the expeditions, um, life looked like being very difficult to make a living. Um, when you get to a certain age where you can't tow 485 pounds anymore, never mind 200. And so to move it into something useful, I started to lecture and to write books. And that just about covered the fact that doing the expedition, nobody paid you. But this swimming thing, I've got to get on top of it. 
it, it's, it's odd that someone who's spent his life being most important is to keep warm. Now the most important thing is to be able to survive being cold for longer times. But other, otherwise, Parkes doesn't seem to have, you know, you, you, like many things, you can have it badly or you can have it not too badly. And what do you think about yourself has allowed you to have such amazing successes? I think that the fact that we've had one or two impossible looking successes, there's two words for it. One is lady luck and the other is DNA. We didn't know what the next step would be. We knew we hadn't got an SOS off. We knew that we were 200 miles west of the Galapagos Islands. We had no water and no food, as we thought then. 